Good morning. Uh, before I introduce the panel members today, I'm going to exercise a couple points of privilege. First of all, to thank ASU for hosting this conference. Um, I live in a modern style house for various reasons, uh, which people say is very pretty. Wouldn't have been my choice because my choice is 18th century, but anyway. <laughs> For a, modern, for a modern law school facility, this is really beautiful. I thank uh, Grant and Stacy for all the hard work they've done in putting this program together. And of course, I thank the Federalist Society, which uh, sponsors the kind of debate and uh, open discussion of important issues that are increasingly difficult to find anywhere in society. And fortunately, free speech is allowed. Uh, I also have a point of privilege uh, in regard to the new judges who are here, since I am the senior judicial officer. <clears throat> and I will congratulate uh, the administration on having raised the bar for circuit court appointees quite considerably. I never would have been in the running for these positions, uh, but all of the younger judges who are speaking or teaching uh, you during this uh, period of time are incredibly well qualified for the positions they have served. They are dedicated to public service and to the rule of law. And one of them isn't even on the bench yet, but I will shout out Bridget Beatty, my former law clerk, who will be up for a vote for the Ninth Circuit in two or three weeks. There you go. But don't get too used to the applause, Bridget. Pretty soon it's going to be dissents all the way. <laughs> so Richard Epstein opened the program yesterday with a, uh, uh, you know, sort of a challenge about the constitutionality of uh, uh, constitutionalization of open and free competitive markets and that they cannot be improved on uh, in the creation of social welfare and therefore they are a constitutional imperative of sorts. Well, we turn today to the practical application or, or uh, consideration of that proposition uh, as it exists in um, our case law, which is hardly as accommodating uh, of uh, of uh, free and competitive markets, but that's because the Supreme Court has uh, held that, oddly enough, in a democracy, the legislatures have the right to structure and uh, make economic regulations as they think fit. However, there has been a little bit of a ripple of activity in regard to saying that some things, even under the rational basis test, are not rational. Why those cases all deal with the uh, issue of funeral caskets, I'm not sure. Uh, Todd Zwicky will uh, open the program and talk to us about that, and then the other panelists will have various perspectives on the um, uh, uh, use of their use or abuse or inappropriateness of the rational basis test when the uh, justification for economic regulation appears to be outright favoritism of one party versus another. Uh, so the first panelists, uh, these are very distinguished speakers. I'm not going to take a lot of time. Professor Todd Zawicki uh, is the George Mason University Foundation Professor of Law at the Ant Antonin Scalia Law School the senior scholar at the Mercatus Center at George Mason and senior fellow of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics. He's held many other positions, including back when he was a young sprout, he assisted me in the uh, National Bankruptcy Review Commission uh, with uh, great, great help. Professor Zwicky clerk for my colleague, Judge Jerry Smith on the Fifth Circuit. Uh, beside him is Professor Ball, Paul Bender, Professor of Law and Dean Emeritus of the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. He's uh, well known in courses on U.S. and Arizona constitutional law, has written extensively on that subject, intellectual property and in Indian law, and is the co-author of the two-volume casebook, Political and Civil Rights in the United States, He's also argued many cases in the U.S. Supreme Court. He clerked, he, he clerked for Judge Learned Hand and Judge Felix Frankfurter. Uh, 
I think that's great. I think that's wonderful. Uh, to, his, to his right is Professor Roderick Hills, another um, alumnus of uh, Fifth Circuit Court Clerkship for my colleague Judge Higginbotham. And Judge Hills uh, is from NYU. He teaches and writes in public law areas with focus on the law governing the division of powers between uh, central and sub-central governments. It's a very comprehensive field. He's published widely in uh, uh, the best law reviews and um, has been a cooperating counsel with the ACLU of Michigan. And finally, Mr. Yaron Brook, actually we all to call him Dr. Brook, uh, is, an, is speaking here as a private citizen, not a lawyer. Uh, but he is chairman of the board of the Ayn Rand Institute and host of a weekly blog talk radio show. Uh, he has been the co-author of several uh, bestsellers, including Free Market Revolution, How Ayn Rand's Ideas Can End Big Government. He is a graduate of the uh, Israeli Defense Forces. He moved to uh, U.S. in the mid-80s, got a MA and PhD in finance at the University of Texas, and has also set up a private equity fund. So he knows about the uh, imposition of extreme government regulation from the ground up. And with that, I will turn it over to Todd Zwicky. Well, thank you, Judge Jones, and let me uh, uh, echo you and congratulate and thank the Arizona State uh, Federal Society for, uh, for hosting us. Um, I know this is a lot of work, and uh, you've done a great job, and it's exciting to be here, and thank you, Dean Bender, for opening uh, your metaphorical home to us. Um, and also, I want to uh, echo Judge Jones and congratulate all the new judges who are here um, uh, and uh, thank you for uh, for uh, picking up the uh, the mantle. So I'm gonna I'm going to kind of give an overview of some of this to orient you as to why basically why this is an issue and why we're doing this panel. And then I'm going to give you some of my own thoughts on it. Um, and what the question here is 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 economic protectionism a legitimate state interest? Uh, and the obvious answer which should pop in your head is no. Uh, uh, as from a common sense perspective, but it turns out to be much more um, complicated than that from a legal perspective, having to do a lot with um, sort of the overhang and the legacy of all those cases coming out of the New Deal where they basically gutted any economic protectionism uh, or any economic pr protections for economic liberties. Uh, and so, uh, you know, sort of the fear of Lochnerism in the background that, uh, uh, that Professor Epstein talked to you about, about last night and sort of the question of what is the role of the judiciary in policing the protection of economic liberties and the right of people to be able to make a living without arbitrary uh, um, the things standing in their way. And of course, it's a bit of an irony considering how active the court has been for so many years in protecting civil liberties, uh, you know, and all, the, all, all these kind of social rights and that sort of thing. But they're kind of trying to figure out where to uh, draw the line now with economic liberties. Um, and I think one of the things that, that we see in this process and why it's important is that as the, 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 there's sort of a back and forth in a game between legislatures and the interest groups uh, that are promoting this with the judiciary. And as judges kind of move out the goalposts, and we've definitely seen this uh, with respect to Chevron, for example, right? As judges move out the fences, legislatures and bureaucrats push to the fences, right? It's not like they're going to stay somewhere in the realm of natural sort of common sense that if the judiciary retreats and retreats and treats, the legislature, for reasons we'll talk about, have a tendency to push out, 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 and try to do more and more and more. And so that's why this matters, right? Which is where you draw the line and whether you draw a line or whether you just basically throw up your hands and say anything goes is basically the question. And so uh, Judge Jones alluded to the casket cases, which is how this is uh, kind of bubbled up uh, most prominently. These are a series of cases brought by, by the Institute for Justice. Um, I got involved in this because over time I have both served as an expert witness uh, in some cases and then written a number of amicus briefs, uh, including uh, submissions to the Supreme Court with respect to the public choice economics and the economics that underlie these laws. And basically what they are are laws that 
oversimplified, basically give a monopoly to funeral home directors in the sale of funeral caskets. In order to be a funeral home director, you have to be a licensed mortician. In order to be a licensed mortician, you have to go to mortuary school for two years. You have to learn how to embalm 50 bodies. You have to do all this sort of stuff in order just to sell a box. Right? Literally, all a funeral casket is is a fancy box. Right? So if you're con concerned about how people's remains are disposed of, you regulate the box, not the person who sells it. Right? But the impact of this is that basically funeral home directors can mark up the price of the fancy box by three or four times. And considering that the casket is one of the most expensive parts of a funeral, um, this is a huge profit center uh, when you create these monopolies for, uh, for licensed, uh, uh, licensed funeral home directors. Right? So what you, when you look at the cases, what you see is three basic approaches uh, of how, how courts deal with this. The first is to basically say, even though rational basis is a low standard of review, you have to have some basis that says this per uh, promotes the public interest in some way. And so what we've seen, for example, with uh, uh, Judge Danny Boggs in the Sixth Circuit and Craig Miles versus Giles, what we saw in the Fifth Circuit in the case uh, of uh, St. Uh, St. Joseph's Abbey, um, uh, which was a, a, a great case involving some monks uh, who would sell funeral caskets in order to basically pay for the operations of the monastery, right? They would make these funeral caskets by hand, and the Louisiana Funeral Board came after them and basically said the monks aren't allowed to sell their caskets, right? And so what happened in those cases is the Sixth Circuit and the Fifth Circuit, they went through, they looked at the justifications that were given for the law in terms of consumer protection and that sort of thing, and unsurprisingly, they found no public interest was uh, advanced by these laws, right? They said the only uh, rationale for these laws is economic protectionism for a well-organized uh, political interest group, namely the funeral home, um, home, funeral home directors. The Louisiana case, I thought, was especially humorous one because in Louisiana, if you wanted to buy a funeral casket, you had to buy it from a funeral home director, but in Louisiana, you weren't even required to be buried in a casket. You could use a sack, essentially, uh, but if it, so, you didn't even have to have a funeral casket. But if you had a funeral casket, then you uh, uh, had to buy it from a, a monopoly provider. The other approach we see it, uh, is uh, an extreme on the other approach, which is what this tees up: is the view that um, economic protectionism, without anything more, is a legitimate state interest. So I think the most prominent case on this, really, and it's the cases are a little fuzzy because, as we'll talk about, they hedge a little bit. But Judge Calabresi, uh, Guido Calabresi in the Second Circuit, had a case um, where I filed an amicus brief where he uh, um, basically acknowledged that the only purpose of the law was to protect a uh, well-organized interest group, but nevertheless, that is a, uh, um, <clears throat> um, a legitimate state interest. And he even quoted from a brief that I submitted in the case where I explained what was going on. And basically, Calabresi says, what you call rent-seeking, I call politics. Right, uh, uh, and that's just the way it is. We defer to the political process. A third view is one that kind of hedges, where the courts will say, and the Tenth Circuit had a very prominent case where they said that as well, <clears throat> where the judges in sort of a flourish said, uh, um, uh, uh, although baseball is the national citizen uh, is the national pastime of the citizenry, passing out economic benefits to well-organized interest groups is the national pastime of legislatures. Uh, and it's not our job uh, to do that. If you don't like it, you've got to appeal to the legislature. We're going to leave it to the legislature to, uh, to, to sort that out. <clears throat> a third view, which you could kind of see to some extent in a concurring opinion and to Judge Calabresi's opinion, which you could see in a concurring opinion to that Tenth Circuit case, is the idea that sort of says, well, um, we're going to kind of pretend, this is, you know, this is my characterization of it, obviously, but we're going to kind of pretend like maybe there's a, uh, a, uh, a public interest here, even though we kind of can't really tell you what it is, right? Uh, basically, their view is, we're going to just, you know, wave our hands, and if we wave it really fast, you won't notice that there's nothing behind the, uh, the curtain, right? Uh, and so they come up with these elaborate sort of far-fetched uh, rationales uh, to, to do it, where they claim that there's just enough of a scintilla of a public, uh, a public interest, right? <clears throat> Those cases are you know, not that, not that interesting for purposes of this, uh, this panel, but I think a lot of what's going on there is a sense that 
the judges, to some extent, there's a comedy thing, I think, going on. And to some extent, it's sort of judges shouldn't go around calling the legislature a bunch of rent seekers and then upholding their laws anyway, uh, I think is partly uh, uh, what it is, right? So that's basically the framework, right, <clears throat> uh, of how courts have approached this, right? And the, two, the last two kind of collapsed together because of the kind of far-fetched nature, I think, of a lot of these arguments about the public interest they make. So I've used the word rent seeking and public choice a couple times. So let me talk about that briefly, and then I'll talk about why it matters for the Constitution. Uh, <clears throat> basically, what we've known, uh, J James Buchanan won the Nobel Prize in economics in 1986 for the study of public choice. And what public choice is, is the application of economics to the study of politics. And the great insight of public choice that's typically credited to Mansur Olson is the idea that the political process tends to overproduce legislation that benefits well uh, well, um, small, homogeneous, well-organized interest groups at the expense of the general public. And it has nothing to do with the wisdom of their laws, but it basically has to do with the ability to organize police free rider problems and collective action problems so that a really well-organized interest group can basically get things put into the law, right? Uh, and the key to this is that in some sense, the political process is not self-correcting against these very small uh, interest groups, right? So if you look at the Casca case, you can see pretty obviously how this comes about, right? Which is most people will buy in most maybe one or two funerals during their lives. Uh, they may not even live in the state where they're buying a funeral, right? Say if you're buying a funeral for your parents or, or something like that. Um, you're not, it's not an issue you're likely to vote on, right? Who regulates uh, this? Who passes these laws? Basically the committee in the state legislature that regulates uh, funeral directors. And so they're basically repeat players uh, with them, right? So the 10th Circuit, for example, says, well, you know, a couple laws have been introduced the last time, uh, few years in committee but, or to, to repeal this, but they've always died in committee. And the answer is, they will always die in committee, all right? Which committee is it? It's the committee that regulates the funeral home directors, right? And so they have an outsized impact over what comes after that. So what you end up with then is people over the course of their lives maybe spend a couple extra hundred or even a couple extra thousand dollars on one or two funerals, hardly enough for anybody to be politically motivated to push back, right? Uh, and hardly enough, certainly, for people to cast a, a cast a vote. And so what you can have then are these laws, whether it's this, whether it's milk subsidies. Why is the tax code that thick? The tax code's that thick because it's full of these special interest carve-outs, right? Little things that cost each of us a buck or two, but can be worth millions or billions of dollars to special interest groups who can organize and carve out little types of, uh, types of things, uh, things like that. And so that's the dynamics of public choice, right? Is that in the political marketplace, well-organized uh, interest groups, small, homogeneous, well-organized uh, interest groups have a, um, um, uh, a disproportionate influence and disproportionate power, right? Um, so why does, how does the Constitution relate to this? Well, uh, two ways, right? Which is, if you think about the Constitution, what is the purpose? The Constitution had two basic purposes. The first was to promote and preserve individual liberty. The second, though, was to, um, as Madison says in, uh, um, in uh, Federalist 10, um, uh, among the numerous advantages proposed by a well-constructed union, none deserves to be more accurately developed than the tendency to break and control the violence of faction. By faction, I understand a number of citizens, whether amounting to a majority or a minority of the whole, who are united and, are, and actuated by some common impulse of passion or interest, adverse to the rights of other citizens or to the permanent and aggregate interest of the community, right? Uh, uh, amounting to a majority or minority who basically commandeer the power of the government not to promote the public interest, but basically to use the force and the power of government to promote their own interest at the expense of the public. That's the purpose of the Constitution, is, is to preserve individual, individual liberty and break and control the vice of faction, which is this tendency for special interest to commandeer the government for their, own, for their own purposes, right? So at least in principle, it seems pretty obvious that this should, uh, anybody who takes the Constitution and the logic of the Constitution seriously, one should be concerned about faction and one should be concerned about minoritarian faction. And so I think where this leads to then is basically the question, which is when it comes to economic market failures, monopoly, fraud, whatever the case would be, typically 
Most people don't just throw up their hands and say, you know, that's the economic market. Even though it's prone to market failure, we're not going to do anything about it, right? We're not going to regulate. We're not going to do this, even though there's potential for, uh, for economic failure. Most people don't say that. The question I have is, should we take the same approach when it comes to political market failure? Because what we have in these cases is a completely predictable failure in the political marketplace, which is, say, this outcome of minoritarian factions commandeering the power of government for their own benefit is an entirely predictable outcome of this process, right? It happens. We know it happens. Um, and should the judiciary do anything about it to the extent they can? I think an argument can be made that the answer is yes. First, basically because it seems that, that the idea that a law should promote something other than the narrow interest, uh, the narrow interest of a well-organized interest group just seems like common sense to some extent, right? And it seems completely consistent with what the goals of the framers were in uh, effectuating the Constitution. I think the second point is, and even if the judiciary is just going after these really, really egregious cases, right? As I said, the problem is, is that government, the interest groups, will tend to, and legislators and regulators, will tend to push to the boundaries, I think. As I said, we've seen this with the growth of the regulatory state. They push. The more the judges defer, the more they push. And you'll be hearing from Peter Wallace in a little bit more about this, I suspect. Uh, and they do the same thing in the states, right? So to the extent that the, leg the, the courts say anything goes, you're going to tendency to get more and more of a tendency to anything goes. More and more arbitrary lawmaking by legislatures, more and more essentially selling of uh, political favors to, uh, to, to interest groups without any effort to try to justify it in light of the, uh, of the uh, um, <clears throat> public interest. So I'll close with one last thought on this, uh, which is I think this creates an interesting tension for those of us who have spent our lives around the Federalist Society. <clears throat> because we all have an appreciation in this room that legislatures are often, usually, have a comparative advantage over judges in effectuating and sort of articulating and understanding the, 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 the views of the majority, right? Majoritarian will in some sense. But I think the question we have to ask ourselves is just because legislatures usually are better than judges, that doesn't necessarily, once you understand public choice and once you take seriously the insights of public choice and the economic science of public choice, you pretty quickly come to realize that that does not mean that legislatures always have an absolute advantage over judges and individuals bringing cases in court in order to effectuate their, uh, their, their, their economic rights. So that where you may have, to, to say that there is a comparative advantage in most cases, I think it is, it's a big leap from that to saying there's an absolute advantage and that judges should always defer to legislatures or bureaucrats or uh, whoever else when it comes to these sorts of things, especially in situations where you can identify a particular political market failure uh, where judges can actually do something about it. Thank you. I assume that somebody from the law school has already welcomed you here, um, but I'd like to do that as well. Uh, it's really terrific to have this here. Uh, I, the Federalist Society has been a, an important part of the educational process at the law school, and it's really nice to have you here to recognize that. Um, you, you provide, whether people agree with you or not, you provide intellectual life and a lot of life to the students and get them interested in public affairs. So you're doing a terrific job of doing that and I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the law school as well as myself. Um, the question we're supposed to talk about is whether economic uh, protectionism is a legitimate state interest. That is not the right question to ask. It assumes that there's a list of legitimate state interests. Just like there's a list in Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution of things that the con uh, Congress has been delegated powers to do. Because the federal government is a government of limited delegated powers. That's not true of state governments. State governments have 
all powers except those denied to them by either the federal or the state constitution. So to look for <coughs> whether there's a legitimate state interest, you're looking for something that has no constitutional relevance. The question for the, that the Constitution raises is, is the thing the state's doing prohibited? That's all the Constitution does in this area with regard to states. With regard to the federal government, the Constitution lays out a limited number of things that the federal government can do. Uh, none of them is uh, provide for economic welfare. <laughs> But there's no list like that for states. States have whatever power they want to have unless it's prohibited by the federal constitution. So the question you should be asking yourself is, is there anything in the, in the federal constitution that prohibits economic protectionism? I can't find it. I don't know where it is supposed to be. In the due process clause? What does due process have to do with economic protectionism? There is something in the Equal Protection Clause which I think can be used, and sometimes is used, uh, to protect us against irrational legislation. But that's the question. It's not whether the state has a legitimate interest. States presumably have any interest they want to have, any interest that the state thinks is, in, that the state legislature thinks is in the state's interest, is a legitimate interest. The question for the court is whether, <clears throat> having announced what interest they're uh, interested in, uh, the state rationally responds to that interest, whether the legislation has a function of, has any purpose of, has any effect of furthering the state's chosen interest, but it's the state's chosen interest. There's nothing in the Constitution that limits the kinds of interests that a state can have. As I said before, that's not true. You, you got to not confuse the states with the federal government. It's completely different. States are all powerful unless the federal Constitution or the state Constitution says no. Um, that's not true of the federal government. So in these cases, <coughs> To look for is there a legitimate state interest is not the right thing to look for. It, what you ask is what does the state say its interest is and then is that interest prohibited by the U.S. Constitution? And I find it hard to see anything in the U.S. Constitution that says states can't use economic protectionism, can't try to protect local interests, or can't choose between different groups in the society, pick one rather than the other. Monopolies. Uh, are monopolies all unconstitutional? No. Uh, as long as the state has some reason to think that the monopoly will help the state, that's a legitimate interest. It doesn't have to be on any list of interests. Once they say what they're trying to do, then the question for the courts, I think, is under the Equal Protection Clause, whether what they're doing is rationally related to what they say they're trying to do. And I think in most of the cases that you're worried about, uh, it, the Equal Protection Clause is not going to be a useful tool against the state legislature because they can always say, they can always find something that's legitimate, that isn't prohibited to do. We're trying to increase the welfare of our citizens in one way or another. Having done that, all I have to show is that some rational person could find some reason to think that what they're doing furthers the interest that they've chosen to follow. That is a very, very easy test to meet. Uh, and I think it's I think it should be a very easy test to me. I don't think you want federal judges with lifetime appointments to decide what's in the interest of states. You have to leave that up to the states. The Constitution provides a very limited role for the federal courts, and that is to say there are some things in the Constitution that the Constitution says states can't do. They can't try to suppress free speech. They can't try to uh, favor one race over another. They can't try to interfere with the free exercise of religion. Those things are prohibited. But unless you can find something like that uh, to, to put against what the state's trying to do, I don't think you're going to have, a, a, I don't think you should, and I don't think you're going to be able to find the state legislation unconstitutional. Those are political battles, which are supposed to be fought out in the state legislatures, not to be decided by some life-tenure federal judge. I don't mean to be against life-tenure. 
Maybe we should think about that. No, I'm serious. <laughs> Life, that, it's important. Life tenure is there to give the judges independence of politics. Then you don't want judges to start making decisions based on politics. They're supposed to make decisions based on constitutional values. And there's no constitutional value that says economic protectionism is wrong. Maybe there should be, but there isn't. Um, so I think you're asking the wrong question. I think if you ask the right question, you're going to run up in, uh, under the, either the Equal Protection Clause, the Substantive Due Process, uh, what they call a rationality test, which is very, very, very easy to pass. Uh, these days, and I think it's going to continue to be that way, unless the court builds up <coughs> some principle, similar, I suppose, to the privacy principle that it has developed, that if, if you want to attack what state legislatures are doing in this area, you have to try to build up a principle the way the court has built up privacy to stand alongside free speech and freedom of religion as one of the values that the Constitution protects, one of the interests that the Constitution says the states are not per per permitted to have. But without doing that, if the question is just generally, is this fair? There's nothing in the Constitution that says you have to be fair. Uh, that may be shocking, but it's true. States don't have to be fair. States can do anything they want unless the Constitution prohibits it. And also, state legislatures don't have to be logical and reasonable. My God, if, if, the, if the Constitution prohibited illogical state legislation, we wouldn't have any constitutional state legislation. The legislative... <laughs> The legislative process is not a logical one. It's one of compromise. Compromises are not logical. Compromises come out with rules that you can't prove are right by logic. That's the political process, and I think the Constitution is intended to let that process work independently of federal judges. They're not supposed to guide and, and supervise that process. They're supposed to decide whether that process interferes with any of the rights that the Constitution protects. Uh, and I don't think that's true in the area of economic protectionism. So that is my message. I can just talk from here, right? Okay. Um, I think I can do this really quick. Um, I thought I didn't before um, Dean Bender spoke, and then I realized I disagreed with him too. So. <laughs> But I'm going to try to do it in six minutes. Um, I only have three points to make, two minutes per points. First, certainly protectionism is not a legitimate state interest um, as an end, but it is a legitimate state mechanism. So you have to distinguish between protectionism as a means and protectionism as an ends. Um, that's the first point, it's a definitional point. Second, having federal courts try to figure out whether a protectionist means is actually a protectionist ends is a fool's game. It probably is a game not worth the candle because the costs are probably greater than the benefits and likely could lead to worse regulation. And third, the solution, therefore, is federalism and separation of powers. And I'll give a few examples of why I think um, Todd is absolutely wrong to say that the political process is so hopelessly infected with special interest capture that you can't trust institutions like the Federal Trade Commission, like Governor John Kasich of Ohio, or like the SEC to deregulate and to get rid of protectionist legislation. I'll give you many examples of deregulatory innovations that have been far more effective than anything that can likely be delivered by the federal courts. First point on definition, very quickly. Um, what is protectionism? It's providing a subsidy by limiting competition. Is that legitimate as a means? Of course, it's been used by, since the founding of the Republic. Alexander Hamilton created the first bank of the United States. Nicholas Biddle's second bank of the United States all had legally protected monopolies. Every bridge company, every grist mill company, every corporation before 1838, when New York enacted the free corporation law and the free banking law, um, had a, some sort of monopoly. The bar association of this state and New York state and every other state is a legally protected monopoly. Every zoning regulation creates grandfathered youths and non-cumulative zones, which are legally protected monopolies. The medallion system in New York City is a legally protected monopoly, and every union's collective bargaining agreement is a legally protected monopoly. If you're going to strike those things down, you're going to be very busy indeed, and you will not have troops behind you. And so the notion that a federal court is going to go around striking down those protectionist devices is ludicrous. 
Those protectionist devices, of course, are always justified as means to an end. What is the end? The end is something like protecting workers from exploitation, providing a reliable fiscal agent for the United States, that's the justification for the Bank of the United States, or simply providing a subsidy for consumer welfare. The medallion system in New York City, it's an abomination, but it is justified as a way of ensuring that taxi cab drivers can hack up. That is to say, they have to spend a lot of money to bring their cabs up to the taxi limousine and commission standards, and they have to go through such training. The idea is we give them a subsidy, not by appropriating tax money for that purpose, but simply by giving them a monopoly. Don't like it? Then strike down the copyright and patent laws, because they use exactly the same mechanism. They give somebody a monopoly, usually for a limited time, in order to put money in their pockets so that the public is benefited. Is there a deadweight cost associated with it? Of course. And my colleague here, Yaron, will explain what that deadweight cost is. But you know what taxes do? They also impose a deadweight cost. Property taxes deter improvements in property. Sales taxes um, inefficiently discourage sales. Income taxes discourage people from working. There is no way you can avoid a deadweight cost. Is the deadweight cost of the monopoly tax bad? Sure. But it's an economic question about whether it's worse than the income tax. At a certain level, I'd much prefer the medallion system than, say, a super millionaire's tax or another layer of taxes in New York City. Um, and I, you'd need to have a PhD in economics to figure out which imposes more excess burden. So as a means, protectionism is perfectly acceptable by what you mean protectionism is a limit on competition. As it ends, it's always been forbidden, and here's how I disagree with Paul, and it's going to kill me on timing. Um, since long before Griswold and his protection on privacy, long before Brown versus Board of Education and its prohibition on ra race discrimination, the courts have always recognized that class legislation that takes from A to give to B is a forbidden state interest. It is forbidden either under the Due Process Clause or the Equal Protection Clause. And to say somehow that it's a wild innovation to say to take from A merely for the purpose of giving to B is not forbidden by the Constitution is to essentially cast doubt on virtually every interpretation of the Equal Protection Clause and the Due Process Clause from the mid-19th century forward, from 1868 forward. All the major treatise writers from John Dillon, D Dillon Christopher Tideman, um, the major constitutional scholars of the time agreed that to take from A, take assets from A merely to subsidize B because you prefer B and you have no other public regarding interest in mind would be unconstitutional. That's eons before anybody dreamed of privacy as being a fundamental right, an unenumerated fundamental right. Furthermore, the prohibitions on regulation of speech and racial discrimination are not in the text of the Constitution as far as states are concerned. The First Amendment says Congress shall make no law. It's a purely non-textual inference far younger than the inference against protectionism that the First Amendment is incorporated against the states. So I disagree that protectionism is a legitimate state interest as an end. It has never been a legitimate state interest as an end, which brings me to my second point. Can courts get rid of it? Well, in theory, yes. But in practice, I think the game is just not worth the candle. Um, there are two difficulties that federal courts face. First of all, you're going to have to make decisions about when protectionism is a means rather than an end. And that involves casting um, stones in a way that's likely to be politically polarizing in an era where we can ill afford more polarization. Let me give you an example from my own experience. A group of NYU law professors went to the State Court of Appeals and said the third year of law school is a protectionist waste of money. It serves no purpose whatsoever except to protect the county bar associations from more competition. So let the students take the law school exam in the third year, before they finish their third year. Um, and we were roundly drowned out by the county bar associations, especially from upstate. Right? Now, did they say, well, we just can't stand the influx of more competition? No, they said that third year is critical for law students' education. How can they be competent lawyers? How can consumers be protected unless they take yet one more seminar from Professor Hills? <laughs> now, I was flattered. <laughs> but what's so funny here is that there's no way that if we filed a federal court uh, a lawsuit citing Todd Zewicki's scholarship and, amic and got an amicus brief from Todd that any federal court would ever strike down bar admissions rules. And part of that is simply I'm, not, I'm going to say this advisedly because Judge Jones is in the room. Um, class interest in the nicest way possible. We're a scholarly protect profession. We expect bar admission rules to have layers and layers of education. We require four liberal arts degree in most states in addition to three years of law school. Do you realize that by that standard, every lawyer in Germany and indeed in continental Europe is unqualified to practice law? Because most of them take, go to law school and they're undergraduate, right? They don't go through four years of college, so why do we need that? Why can't students just go right to law school as an undergraduate? Um, there's no way you could justify that, and yet there's no way courts will strike it down. 
And so what does Todd, what do the anti-protectionist folks say? When a court strikes down, say, occupational licensing for beauticians as protectionist, which it is, most certainly. And then when you say, okay, well, what about all that protection for lawyers? Oh, that's different. You see, lawyers are a scholarly profession. <laughs> How can anybody not see that that's outrageous rank class bias? Why would we put federal judges in the position of picking and choosing among occupational licensing like that? They can't do it and sustain their political legitimacy. They shouldn't try. Now, there's one thing they can do, but I would say it's a very risky thing to do, and that's to pick low-hanging fruit. So my favorite case came from my judge, Pat Higginbotham. He was a great judge. He's a great lawyer. And he wrote a great opinion in St. Joseph's Abbey, the case that was described by Todd. Um, and that was a case in which the judge said, there is no conceivable non-protectionist use of this regulation that requires you to be a licensed funeral home director to sell a casket. Well, of course, what the funeral home establishment said is, no, you know, people who buy a casket, they need grievance counseling to make sure they don't make a rash decision in this very vulnerable moment. And of course, what my judge could say is, yes, but Louisiana law doesn't require funeral directors to have any grievance training. Made it easy to strike this law down. But of course, what does that kind of decision incentivize the state funeral home directors to do? Require grievance counseling. Right, layer on the educational requirements. In other words, the low-hanging fruit are under-inclusive regulations that obviously don't pursue the end that they purport to pursue. But the danger is that you will inspire making them over-inclusive, right? Let me give you an example from New York, my last example, and then of course I'll end with the moral of the story, which is blessedly brief. Um, in New York City, we have non-cumulative industrial zones. That is to say, you can only have manufacturing in these zones. You can't have residential or commercial. You can't have hotels. You can't have all sorts of uses that don't impose any harm on anyone. Now, what justification is offered for these zones? Well, the idea is we're trying to provide cheap land for manufacturing. Because manufacturing provides good union jobs. And of course, if you don't have residential real estate developers bidding on the lots, it radically lowers the prices of the lot. So you can have, say, well, for instance, this is true, the South Brooklyn Casket Factory, which is in Gowanus, right near my house, right? They have much lower rent because, of course, their landlord can't find a residential real estate developer to build. They had one, but he was driven away by the zoning. Now, what we can say in response is this is radically under-inclusive because you don't require the South Brooklyn Casket Company to provide good union jobs. Actually, these jobs typically stink. Most industrial jobs in these non-cumulative zones are warehouses, and the warehouse workers aren't union. And he's like, ha, I've won. I've struck down this law, except then the next rule will be only union industrial uses can go in the manufacturing zones, which would make these things eons worse. The dilapidated industrial zones that used to plague New York City before Bloomberg would be all over the place, and there wouldn't be anything in them. They'd just be illegally rented out as cheap housing before the um, zoning commission stages a rage, raid. So I really think there's grave dangers to federal judges getting involved in this area. But fortunately, the moral of the story I'm ending now, there are other institutions that can be involved. St. Joseph's Abbey critically relied on Federal Trade Commission regulations that got rid of a swath, got rid of a swath of outrageous protectionist funeral home practices. Likewise, between 1975 and 1980, the federal government deregulated brokers, truckers, airlines, telecommunications, all through initiatives from people who were chairing agencies allegedly captured by the industry. My father, in fact, who was chair of the Securities and Exchange Commission at the time, led a major initiative to re deregulate brokerage, brokers commissions. So the idea that somehow dad was captured by the brokers strikes me as nonsensical. And by the way, if you think dad was captured, why don't you think the federal judges are gonna be captured? Do you think hiring counsel is cheap? And so it seems it strikes me as ludicrous to say the federal judges are our salvation. Oh, those bureaucrats and politicians, they'll never deregulate. John Kasich has launched one of his last efforts in office was to launch a major deregulation effort on occupational licensing, saying that every six years we have to um, check out the commissions that provide these monopolies and decommission them, sunset them, if they don't seem to serve a purpose. So trust in politics. We have federalism and separation of powers for a reason. They can be used to solve many of these problems. I think at the margin, the federal courts probably won't make it much better and probably will make it a lot worse because they have to accept protectionism as a means and although they can't accept protectionism as an ends, they don't have the tools at their hands to distinguish between the means and ends. And if they try to use the tools that they have aggressively, they may very likely make the regulation they're trying to cure worse. Thanks. So I feel like a fish out of water, um, not a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs>
I, I'm not going to make my comments about what judges should or shouldn't do. I have no clue. I have no clear opinion about that. I, I'm really going to address here more the political philosophy uh, aspect of this and the economic aspect of this. I think the reason I've been invited here is because I might be the only one who can make uh, Professor Epstein seem like a moderate. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> so I, I'm going to take the common sense approach that Todd, I think, uh, initially started off um, with, uh, where uh, you read economic protectionism, is it a legitimate state interest? No. <laughs> that seems quite self-evident. That seems quite obvious. Uh, put aside constitutionality, the state has no interest, should have no interest in establishing monopolies or in, in my view, any kind of economic activity. And this really begs the question of what is the role of the state? What is the role of government? And this maybe harkens back to yesterday's panel more than it does to today's. But what is the purpose of government uh, is really the answer from a political philosophy perspective, one has to answer in order to figure out whether economic protectionism is a legitimate state interest. If the role of government is to hand out favors and to hand out uh, the, the to, to divvy up the social pie in a way that seems legitimate to legislatures or to or, or some kind of democratic process, then sure, government can do anything. But is that the role of government? Should that be the role of government? And, and was that the intention, at least, of uh, some of the founders of this particular country? And I would argue the answer to all of those is no. The role of government is to protect individual liberties. I think the founders are quite clear in the Declaration of Independence about what that role is. It's to protect our rights, our individual rights, our individual rights to life, liberty, I wish there was property there, but property, and the pursuit of happiness. It is to leave us free, to protect our freedom, to protect our freedom to engage in voluntary activities that do not impose coercion, that do not impose force, that do not impose authority over other people. Ideally, that is it. That means the voluntary exchange, voluntary transactions in an eco in a, in, uh, in economic sense should be protected under economic liberty, should be protected as any other voluntary exchange and should be immune from state regulation any state regulation and any state control. The role of government is in the economic sphere to intervene when fraud occurs, when there is, uh, where, where clearly people are using coercion, coercion uh, in, in their economic transactions, but otherwise to leave the economy alone. Richard Epstein yesterday said that free markets cannot be improved upon. That is absolutely right. But it's not just right from the perspective of social welfare, a term that you know, I, I'm dubious about its, uh, its uh, philosophical legitimacy. But also, but for, certainly it, 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 it is a truth from an economic perspective in terms of maximizing economic well-being. But it also is a truth in terms of free markets cannot be improved upon in terms of individual liberties, in, in terms of our ability to pursue our own happiness. Markets are required in order for us to be able to pursue our own happiness. And the role of government is to preserve those markets or to protect those markets from the initiation of force by the Bernie Madoffs of the world. And, and, and it's worth noting, just, uh, just, uh, just as an aside, when we talk about regulation, that of course Bernie Madoff was not, the, the government failed in its ability to protect us from a Bernie Madoff. Uh, the SEC, which was already mentioned, failed to actually catch Bernie Madoff uh, and, and, and do anything to stop his massive fraud. It was family members who actually ultimately uh, discovered his fraud. And I would argue that to a large extent the SEC was unable to catch Bernie Madoff because they were too busy monitoring me and people like me who are uh, legitimate actors in the financial market. The SEC is doing so many things, it can't catch the crooks. And, and uh, in, in most cases, the crooks are not caught on financial markets. Instead, uh, there is a, there's plenty of prosecution over all kinds of uh, 
insignificant details and insignificant uh, violations of the rules. Uh, so, in my view, in the economic realm, the only role of government is to define property rights and protect them. Basically, that's it, and protect us from th these fraud. Now, I, I, I want to say a little bit about economic consequences just to, to, to beef up this idea of free markets cannot be improved upon, because they cannot. If, if one just looks at history before the existence of any kind of protection of property rights and any kind of free markets, existence of free markets, or any kind of existence of economic liberty, we were all dirt poor. I mean, all of us were dirt poor. It is only the protection of economic liberty that led to economic success, to economic prosperity, uh, to economic thriving, to the massive economic growth that was the 19th century, a 19th century that had very little state intervention, uh, some, but very little state intervention as compared to today in terms of uh, economic liberties. And uh, I think, I think uh, again, Professor Epstein yesterday mentioned uh, 1870 to 1940, I would say probably 1930, 1870 to 1930, as, as a period of massive economic boom, a massive economic success in the United States, to a large extent, because that is the freest period, not just in American economic history, but probably in world economic history, for any country, any place, at any time. But if that is not proof enough, then all one has to do is look <laughs> around the world and observe clearly that those states, those countries that have allowed for economic liberty, that have protected property rights, that have, uh, that have restrained the state from intervening in economic activities, have succeeded, have flourished, have created wealth, have extended life, have, have done wonderful things for, for, for human beings, that economic liberty pays off, and it pays off quickly and incredibly effectively. And it's, it's so tragic and sad that, uh, that whether it's the fault of legislatures, the courts, the, the Constitution, whatever, it is so sad that economic liberty has been in such massive decline in the United States, and we have been moving away from economic liberty for such a long time. And the consequences, I think, of that are all around us. The consequences are uh, low, slow economic growth, uh, low wage growth, increased uh, or decreased, significant decreased social mobility, economic mobility, all the things that are obvious from an econo economist's perspective. Once you institute licensing laws, once you institute minimum wages, once you institute all kinds of economic interventions in the economy and protectionist policies, you're going to, the result is going to be massive deadweight losses, massive economic constraints, massive economic slowdown, and that's exactly what we've been experiencing for a very long time, and if we don't start turning the ship around, it's gonna get a lot worse. Thank you. Typically, uh, what we do is we uh, let the panelists respond to each other for about five minutes apiece, and then we open the panel to questions, so Todd. Great, I'll just say a few things. First is with respect to, um, to Paul's good question, where's the, the constitutional repository for this? I think Rod uh, well mentioned that it's always been around in some sense. But, but equally valid is a lot of these cases have an interstate commerce component. And to the extent we care about interstate commerce is, at all, uh, it, it seems to, to stick here. So for example, <clears throat> Craig Miles versus Giles involved a case, I believe that was the case, where um, it was a minister who wanted to uh, 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 sell caskets over the internet, uh, for example. Maybe that was not, the, but, but for example, there are casket companies out there who sell caskets over the internet, right? They have like a big warehouse in South Dakota and you like log on and you order a casket and it gets FedEx to the funeral home in time for the, uh, for, for uh, things a, a couple days later, right? And um, you can get special caskets with your, you know, the logo of your university on it or a Chicago Cubs logo or whatever. Uh, and you could, and so there's like a huge booming uh, sort of market uh, in, in this stuff. So a lot of these cases do pretty directly involve interstate commerce of, uh, of, a, of a pretty straightforward uh, uh, fashion. Um, I would all, uh, and then uh, um, I'll just say a few words about Rod's uh, fascinating uh, uh, comments, which is, um, 
First, I'll accept Rod's criticism that I was not quite cynical enough about the political process. Um, obviously, I was sugarcoating it. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but Rod said, even if you pluck the low-hanging fruit, this system is such a, I'll, I'll paraphrase it in a way that I like, um, but, but he probably would say it is inaccurate. Uh, the, the interest groups are so powerful that even if you pluck the low-hanging fruit, they'll just get in there even more, right? They'll worm their way into the cracks even more and just make the laws even yuckier uh, than they are. Um, I think that's a valid criticism, and I think that's probably true uh, to, to some extent, uh, which is it's a pretty ruthless dynamic uh, of when legislatures sell political favors, um, and I think that's a legitimate concern. And I think there's, to some extent, at root there an empirical question, uh, which is to what extent Will it raise the cost sufficiently that you end up with less rent-seeking uh, legislation at the end of the day versus to what extent do you just end up with worse uh, in more or less the same amount? And I think there's a good lesson here, which is if you look at the antitrust cases like the North Carolina Board of Dental Examiners uh, where the Supreme Court was policing rules issued by a dental board, right? <clears throat> Um, and they said you have to have um, uh, a majority of non-practicing dentists in order to basically have a valid regulatory structure. I think, it's a good, I think it's a valid point that to some extent that's putting fingers in the dike because if you just look at the, the boards and whether the boards are exceeding their legislative authority, they'll just go back and get the legislatures to give you more of a blank check, right? I think that's a, quite a valid uh, a concern, and I think it's a concern in this case that even if you pluck the, uh, the low-hanging low fruit, and so I think there's an interesting empirical question there. My sense is that it would raise the cost sufficiently uh, that in the end um, things would be better off, but, uh, but I'm willing to uh, consider his, um, his uh, uh, criticisms. I'd like to flag one last point because I think it is an important point, which is I don't think of this as an either or, and he made a very persuasive case about the power of uh, regulatory reform and legislative reform. And his example of the 1980s I think is a great one, which is uh, deregulation really started in the 1970s under the Carter administration. Uh, Ford, even with Ford, right? Uh, Ford and then Carter uh, with Alfred Kahn, right? Uh, and then the Reagan administration. Um, and essentially then, eventually, the left turned against deregulation. Uh, and the, the uh, explanation seems to be that, uh, that deregulation had an adverse effect on unions, uh, which is unions only exist to bargain over rents. Uh, unions cannot raise the equilibrium uh, wage. Uh, in, that's just set by supply and demand. But they can bargain over rents, uh, economic rents in an industry. So you've got to create rents, and rents are always created by regulation, whether it was airline regulation or railroads or trucking or you know, uh, 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 car, you know, basically protectionism for cars or whatever, right? And so the left turned against it once they understood that what was good for a consumer was bad for unions, is essentially, in a nutshell, uh, uh, what happened. But we do have a potential opportunity here today, right? We saw uh, promising words from the Obama administration in the White House, and they made a case for occupational licensing reform. And I think we do, and I, and I want uh, to emphasize what, what Rod says, there is a political moment here where the left is concerned about the impact of occupational licensing, in particular on low-income and minority people, uh, uh, workers, because of the arbitrariness of these and a lot of the educational requirements, like you said about sort of the arbitrary requirements for to become a lawyer, but a lot of other things just now routinely require a college degree uh, for, you know, for things that in no way are related uh, to that. And so they were concerned about the impact on low-income workers and minority workers of, uh, of credentialing and the cost. Uh, and of course, conservatives were interested in competition choice and innovation and the like. And so I think there is a moment here. Uh, and, uh, and you know, public opinion and public education is, uh, is, is a part of this. I'm not willing to say that a, uh, an engaged judiciary, though, is not uh, potentially a, uh, a useful part of it as part of that larger process. Ben, Professor Bender. Yeah. Um, I, the thing that struck me most in what uh, Dr. Brick said he said, let's put aside constitutionality. Let's put aside constitutionality. And then you did put it aside. I thought that's what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. If you want to talk about economic policy, that's fine. But I don't think judges, do you, should make economic policy. They're not trained to do it. And mostly they shouldn't do it because they're not, at least life tenure judges in the federal courts, are not immediately responsive to the democracy to what the people want, and that's supposed to be. 
You don't want people who are not supposed to be responsible to the people making economic policy, I don't think. Um, one other thing, even if it's right that the federal constitution um, set limits on what the federal government can do, what about the states? There's nothing in the federal constitution, I don't think, except the 14th Amendment, that limits what states can do. States can do whatever they want. That's an essential part. You, you can't forget about that in talking about the American constitutional system. The states are different. The states are supposed to be different. The states are supposed to be free to do what they want unless the federal constitution says no. Uh, and it's just wrong to treat the states as if they were the federal government. You have to search in the Constitution for something that authorizes what they do. No, they are authorized to do anything they want to do unless the Constitution says no. And I say again, I don't see anything in the Constitution that says states are not allowed to engage in economic protectionism. That doesn't mean I don't think economic, that's, I don't think there, that economic protectionism is bad. Sometimes it's very bad. But those are political questions. Our system doesn't, I don't think, want those questions to be decided by life tenure, unelected judges with no, mostly, economic training and no day-to-day -day contact with the community. That's not democracy. Um, Professor Hill? Just two quick points. Um, I can't believe I left out the state constitutional courts, the state supreme courts, is an antidote to protectionism. Rather than filing lawsuits in the federal courts trying to enforce the 14th Amendment, I strongly recommend that you go to the Institute of Justice and my classmate Dana Berliner, sitting right there, and get her to come up with great theories into the state constitutions, because the state constitutions often have elected judges, and they often are fonts of really interesting deregulatory initiatives. That's my, my first amendment, friendly amendment. It's not just governors. It's not just agencies like the FTC and the SEC. The state courts are out there. They can help you out. A second quick point. I think, and this, this is because I see Richard there, my colleague Richard, and we always lock horns over the question of what the framers believed in terms of libertarian ideas. I hate to say it, but those federalists for which the Federalist Society were named were rank protectionists. Alexander Hamilton approved a monopoly for the Bank of the United States, making it the exclusive fiscal agent for the United States government, a bounty for New England cod fishermen, and a high tariff on imported manufactured goods. He hated Adam Smith and wrote a little report saying that Adam Smith was all wrong, that a young country needed to protect its infant industries with high tariff walls. The Republican Party kept with the Hamilton Creed all through the McKinley era, all through the 1890s, up through the early 20th century. It wasn't until Smoot, up through Smoot Hawley. So the notion that the framers were all these wild-eyed Jacksonian libertarians would really surprise, well, for among others, the wild-eyed Jacksonian libertarians. <laughs> Jefferson made his career saying Hamilton was too statist. Um, so let's not pretend that somehow back in 1789 there was this libertarian paradise dreamed up by the framers um, and somehow we spoiled Eden by electing FDR. Um, <laughs> On the other hand, we didn't have anyone proposing to take over the entire economy in, in the guise of uh, cha climate change, right? <laughs> Something has changed. Well, I think we did spoil Eden, or at least as close as humanity has come to Eden. So, uh, so I, you know, I, I don't think you have to believe that the, that the funny fathers who were uh, already, you know, geniuses and did so much got everything right. I don't think they did. Uh, we have the benefit of 250 years of hindsight. So, uh, you know, we, we, we can look back and say, you know, maybe Hamilton was wrong about the bank and about tariffs. Although you can't say that these days about tariffs. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, so and he's got a musical. And, and we've got a president who agrees with him on tariffs. So, um, so uh, you know, again, my, my role here is not to talk about what judges can or cannot do, but to appeal to you as uh, law students, I think law students, I think lawyers, I think, uh, you know, play a disproportionate role in setting the direction of a country. 
uh, not just as uh, judges, not just in your function as lawyers, but just as intellectual leaders within your communities, as intellectual leaders within the world in which you live. And I think it is uh, good for you once in a while to hear some opinions that don't just come from uh, the perspective of we're going to treat the Constitution as the truth, but rather let's look at what is the truth and if the Constitution needs to be amended in order to fix it, you know, one day maybe we'll get to the point where we can do that, at least uh, I would like to believe that day is possible. Um, certainly the Constitution has been amended in the past and, and uh, I think when it comes to economic liberties, I think the founders left a lot on the table that can be fixed an amendment and, and, and improved upon. Uh, but to do that, one has to engage in education first. One has, has to first have people who actually believe that economic liberty is important and that economic liberty is, a, is an important personal liberty and is an important uh, part of what it means to have the right to life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness. And that is, I think, what the Federalist Society is partially all about. It's about that educational process. So I would, I would encourage you to sometimes go out of the bounds of just talking about this case or that case, I find it weird, I guess we, we talked about this, about how this is so morbid. It's all, uh, it's all uh, uh, about uh, funeral homes and so on. Right? Uh, it, uh, and, 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 to, and to really think more philosophically, more broadly, and more economically about what should the policies be, not just what they are. Uh, and, uh, and, and to question some of the democratically, I mean, there's a, there's a large sense in which, uh, in which the Constitution is trying to protect us from democracy. And I think that's something we have lost. And uh, I, you know, I'm not a big fan of majority rule, of conventional majority rule democracy. The majority is often, I'd say almost always, wrong. And, uh, and, and part of the Constitution is there to protect us from that. Maybe that's a point of view that needs to be resurrected um, and, and thought about uh, state legislatures and voters do and say a lot of really, really, really bad stuff. And, uh, and we should fight against it. Thank you. I'll just make one comment before we uh, open it to questions. It's really interesting to hear uh, from some of our panelists that the solution to these problems of rent seeking and uh, market failure is either federalism or, uh, or judicial, well, that judicial abdication is necessary because on, on the other hand, certain people are not um, reluctant to say that the federal judges are the ones who ought to be making fundamental policy on life and death, national security, uh, and even, uh, 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 but then have to keep their hands off of uh, what appear to be uh, questionable uses of the equal protection uh, rulings in uh, having special college admissions, well there, we have to defer to the superior wisdom of the academic elites. There's a lot of uh, inconsistencies going on here. Pardon me? That's, that's you, that's not me. They're criticizing federal judges, God forbid, but. <laughs> We're doing a heck of a job. We're doing it. <laughs> so uh, I open it to the audience, any questions? Sonia. Mike Doherty from Atlanta. I'm, I'm curious, uh, Professor Mills, about this federal judges versus... Um, Hills. Hills, I'm sorry. <laughs> about uh, uh, federal judges versus commissioners at the agencies, because I don't see how they're not, in a different way, more unaccountable than a lifetime appointed judge. They're appointed politically. They fade in the woodwork when terms change and they have Chevron deference in many ways. I don't know how that's, uh, can you expound on why you, I heard you at least feel like that you were thinking that's some sort of solution. Well, I just like the idea of a body that is politically accountable. Um, notice and comment rulemaking allows for politics. Agencies, especially within their Chevron space, are making policy. And I think more often than not, the best way to go after protectionism is to treat it as a policy matter. It's a policy matter that's constitutionally informed. Um, but the Constitution is not merely supposed to be enforced by federal judges, but also by policy animals. And I think that agencies, both state and federal, 
State constitutional courts with a mandate, and often a constitution, state constitution that's easily amended, can take into account the political and the policy aspects of constitutions. Um, I belong to a sort of NYU school of constitutionalism. There's a lot of us up there. Daryl Levinson is one. Rick Pildes is another. Who thinks that a lot of what the Constitution defines is a bunch of very general values. One of them is the anti-protectionist value that is best cashed out through politics. And I, therefore, I'm looking for venues where politics can most, most effectively be pursued by entities that have the most accessible, transparent political remedies. Anybody can file a comment on regulations.gov. Anyone. Do you know what it costs just to get an amicus brief printed, right? So if you're trying to have a real political debate about a hot value like protectionism, why would you go to say the Fifth Circuit rather than to regulations.gov? And to say that agencies won't be responsive to those appeals, I think is just to blind yourself to the reality that they often are. Well, I'm sorry, I have to just say this real quickly. I, I will send you the 11th Circuit uh, filings and the rulings against the Federal Trade Commission who absolutely did not, who argued in front of the, the 11th Circuit that they do not have to go through rulemaking and that they, they, they just don't. And they, and they try to get away with it because who's going to pay to fight them? So it's an interesting discussion for later, but thank goodness for the federal judges in the 11th Circuit. Rod, okay. if I could just ask, I didn't want to intercede, but I'm, I'm interested, and this is gen a genuine question. It's going to sound like a smart aleck question, <coughs> genuine question, which well, is, yeah, it could, uh, but, uh, but I'm just gen your, your impression as to, you were talking about politics. Do you think there is more rent seeking now uh, in the co economy and body, body politic than there was? Um, and if there is, do you think that's good, bad, or ind indifferent? I'm just, I'm genuinely just curious. Well, I don't want to monopolize the time. I would say it uh, depends what you mean by now and then. Um, the 19th century was rife with extraordinary protectionist regulation. The notion that the 19th century was a libertarian paradise has been debunked by my former colleague at University of Michigan, legal historian Bill Novick, who wrote a whole book about what counties, towns, and states were doing in terms of licensing, exclusive franchises. It might, um, the New Jersey educational system was entirely funded by the Camden and Amboy Railroad, um, largely because the Camden and Amboy Railroad had a exclusive franchise, and then the New Jersey people scooped up a big share of the money. So the idea that the 19th century was a libertarian paradise, I think, is a mistake. Um, so, you know, compared to when and what, I don't know. I would say this is, I agree with you, Todd, 100% on this, there's a magic moment right now where there is a large number of people on the left who are upset by exclusionary zoning, who are upset by occupational licensing, who can see that poor people are getting shafted by regulations often made in the name of their protection. And so this is a great moment for Dana Berliner because when she marches into court, she often has a Mickey on the left, often. Now, we live in a time in which you guys are roundly hated by many people on the left. And yet this is a great opportunity for the Federalist Society to cooperate with people on the left and find common ground. That itself is extraordinary, which is why I would take every political venue to emphasize this policymaking initiative. I tend to think that when the federal courts get involved, it causes a lot of people to get nervous that, wait a minute, if they're going to strike down what they call protectionism here, what are they going to do someplace else? Or what will a left judge, a Stephen Reinhardt, do when he says, oh, you think you can make policy on protectionism? I think I can make policy on a lot of other stuff. And so I think that's kind of going nuclear very fast. It don't you think it's already gone nuclear in Well, I actually don't think. There's a lot of left judges who are beginning to have second thoughts about the judiciary. Now, of course, we know why, right? But use that energy. Use that energy. You've been fighting for years to say the federal judiciary shouldn't be the font of all policymaking wisdom. Don't give up on it now. Now that you've got fair weather friends, lock them in. Sign the deal. Get some precedence. You, but you, would you have upheld the casket regulation had you been in Judge Higginbotham's position? Oh, that's a tough one. I might have said a shot across the bow there doesn't hurt because it was such low-hanging fruit. So I think every once in a while you can knock one of these things off. Um, I don't think you want to go too far, but it does send a little bit of a signal that might give... Other venues, a little more power, because um, they say, well, you know, in the extreme case, right. you could imagine this would be illegal. But in general, I think that's reaching the very limit. And I think the thing that made Judge Higginbotham's opinion effective is that the FTC had actually done all the work, yeah. and the Louisiana Board of Examiners 
funeral home examiners had done nothing. They'd written such a lame regulation. I mean, if you're going to cite grievance counseling as your basis and then not have any <laughs> grievance training, that seemed ridiculous. So yeah, there are a few cases like that, but um, I would caution that it's extremely dangerous to go much far beyond the most Well, then you're level. telling Dana that she's fighting an uphill battle. No, nope, she's going through the Texas Supreme Court in Texas on a zoning matter. Um, you're doing both. Stick with the states. Stick with the states, Dana. Any comments, Professor Bender? Uh, yeah, there's one thing that I motivated to say by some of the things I've heard. Everybody keeps talking about the Constitution. We got 51 constitutions. And it's very important, especially from your point of view, to remember that. Because the economic theories that you would like to see in the federal constitution, which I don't think are there, if you put those theories into a state constitution, there's nothing to stop a state from putting in its constitution principles of economic freedom that would prevent the state legislature from interfering with economic freedom. There's nothing in the US Constitution to stop a state from doing that. So I think the battle, battles you're talking about, if you want to do it in constitutional terms, do it in state constitutional terms. State, con state courts are much closer to the people there. I think their judgments about what should be in the state constitution are worth a lot of respect. Don't try to change something for the whole country. That's not. Federalism is an important part of the United States. Things are not decided, most things, almost all things, are not decided and shouldn't be decided on the federal level. They should be decided by the states. That's the system that was set up. That's a system you can use to further the interests of economic freedom. Just use the state. If you can get a state to decide that's what it wants the state to be, Fine, the federal constitution doesn't stop that. That kind of variety in state approaches is, I think, very important and useful. So bear in mind the state constitution. Just don't forget it and assume it's just like the US constitution. Of course, it doesn't have to be. And a lot of state Supreme Courts are beginning to pull away from the idea that their constitutions mean the same thing that the US constitution means. OK, the question over here. Thank you all for coming in today and for speaking to us. Um, I had a question for Dean Bender. Um, I generally agree with um, your points about state rights and the state constitutions, but I think what at least I found interesting and have loosely connected to the discussion on economic protectionism is where cases like Janus and the Oregon um, cases against the state bar associations will take us in terms of freedom of association impacting economic protectionism. Well, if there are principles of freedom of association, do you there are principles of freedom of association in the U.S. Constitution, and if they're being violated, you yeah, use them. But use the principles that are in the Constitution. You're trying, a lot of you, it seems to me, are trying to create a constitutional principle that just isn't there and wasn't intended to be there. And also, that if that principle is going to be there as a constitutional matter, what was intended is that the states adopt constitutions that protect those rights. All rights don't come from the federal constitution. Most rights do not come from the federal constitution. Okay, over here. Uh, yes, hi, uh, Bill Hodes, formerly from Indiana, uh, when Mike Pence was a law student there, now from Florida. Um, I'm a colleague of uh, Dana's from another point of view. We're on the uh, professional responsibility uh, the Executive Committee of the Professional Responsibility group, uh, uh, Practice Group of the Federalist Society. And one of the things that we deal with uh, to some extent is, it was sort of mentioned, the, the unauthorized practice rules, uh, but state to state, uh, it's lawyers are much more mobile than casket makers are. And so the, the, the question I, wa I wanted to follow up on something you said, Todd, just very, very briefly, is to what extent do many of these issues in today's society, where there's so much more mobile, do many of these intrastate monopolies blend into or bleed into interstate uh, issues 
because you mentioned the Commerce Clause, but it's actually the dormant Commerce Clause that could be in play here, and also Article 4, Section 2, and both of those are in the keeping of the federal courts. Um, and so I wonder whether there's some room for uh, development in that area, agreeing with you that, 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 that we, we don't want federal judges riding herd on the entire society, but this, I this is one little niche where the, the federal courts have a particular ro role and in the dormant commerce clause almost the exclusive role. Yeah, thanks for that, that question and, it's, and it really hits on an important issue which is um, one of the things that's been documented, I don't think Yaron mm -hmm. mentioned this in his remarks, but there has actually been a, uh, a surprising and unexpected um, decline in, inter in interstate mobility over the past couple decades. And uh, which has a huge adverse impact on, can on, on macroeconomic uh, development. And one of the factors, one of the important factors that's been pointed to is occupational licensing, uh, which is in the 1970s, about 4% of the American population worked in a, uh, in a occupation that required a license. Now I think it's about a third. Um, and so if you are licensed uh, as, a, as a teacher or a lawyer or uh, a plumber or an electrician, right, um, you might have to move to another state. You might have to requalify for the license. You might have to do all these different sorts of uh, sorts of things, and that has an adverse impact on um, on uh, on the economy, especially in a world in which you've got two two working spouses usually. So one group, for example, who's really adversely impacted by this is military spouses, for example. Uh, members of the military move a lot. Military spouses are basically unemployable because of the time they can get qualified to say become a teacher in their new state or something like that, um, they're getting moved again, right? And so I think this is an important, uh, an important factor in terms of the growth of uh, occupational licensing. And nobody's come up with a good explanation for why we both have so many more people who need licenses and why licensing has become so much more rigid. Like I said earlier, you know, the number of uh, occupations that re just require a college degree uh, for, for, for some reason uh, is, uh, is part of this. And so th I think that's, um, you know, and, and I, think the, I think there's a pretty clear nexus there um, on, with respect to some of these things, with respect to interstate commerce. And I wanna urge those in this room uh, you know, a lot of federal society people are skeptical about the Dormant Commerce Clause because it's not in, in the Constitution. But I think the non-discrimination element of uh, the Dormant Commerce Clause is um, pretty powerful. I think it, uh, it, it, it's in there. One can argue about the balancing uh, test under Pike uh, Bruce Church, right? But, uh, but I think the logic that the Commerce Clause implicitly includes a, a non-discrimination uh, 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 element is, is important. Is, is there and it's important. Um, and you know how it plays out, I mean, it's an interesting question, but, uh, but I think a lot of this does it, you know, intrinsically hit on interstate commerce today as well as anything involving the internet. So. Yeah, I agree with that completely. There is a value of the freedom of interstate movement and interstate commerce in the US Constitution. Uh, and that's there to use when you have, and I agree that I think the Dormant Commerce Clause is quite questionable in the area of too much uh, of a burden on commerce. But discrimination against interstate commerce, I think that's a very strong principle, and I think it's there to use if states are doing to stop interstate movement, the freedom of interstate movement, which is a very strong value of the American Constitution. Yeah, I wanted to say something about Article 4, Section 2, because that's where a lot of the reciprocity litigation has come with bar memberships. Um, here's the kind of scenario, it happened with Arizona actually, a New York lawyer comes to Arizona, wants to practice law, wants to wave in, and Arizona says, oh, you're a member in good standing of the New York bar, but you haven't taken the Arizona bar exam. And he says, well, why don't you let me wave in? And Arizona says, yeah, well, because New York doesn't let Arizona lawyers wave in. And so it's quid pro quo, pal. When New York lets our Arizona folks practice in New York, we'll let you practice in Arizona. Now, that kind of rule on reciprocity, where you let lawyers wave in from states that let your lawyers wave in, is obviously protectionist. And there have been briefs filed under Article 4, Section 2, the Privileges and Immunities Clause, saying that's obviously protectionist. But I counsel the lawyers who file those briefs. If you succeed, will you actually deregulate the legal profession, or will you encourage states to just get rid of reciprocity altogether? <laughs> so just watch yourself. And this is what I mean when I say litigation is a dangerous tool. Um, it can backfire. 
I mean, if, uh, if Arizona really wanted to get aggressive, I don't think it would, but it might say, fine, we won't have reciprocity with anyone. Everybody's got to take the darn bar. And I don't think that would be good for interstate mobility. Not law professors. <laughs> <laughs> Just I just wanted to put that in. I still got to do CLE on ethics, though. <laughs> Over here. Hi, I just had a, uh, a question uh, addressing Dean Bender's remarks. So Dean Bender, uh, in his opening statement, and then briefly just now, said that we're all looking for a principle in the federal constitution that just isn't there. Um, this debate about economic protectionism bumping up against economic liberty. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I was just wondering if uh, the rest of the panel could uh, justify finding the principle in the federal constitution and uh, if not, why not? Thanks. Find what principle? Uh, it seems to me that Dean Bender was referring to the principle of economic liberty in the federal constitution. I know Dean Bender knows about the privileges and immunities clause, but, uh, or maybe I misunderstood his remarks, but uh, that's the principle I was referring to. That would have been, I think, it's a better place to try to find it than in substantive due process. The Supreme Court, as you know, has not been very friendly to that argument. Uh, I, the Supreme Court got it all wrong at the beginning. All of the individual rights that the Supreme Court has recognized, I think, should have been recognized under the Privileges and Immunities Clause. But it's too late to turn that back because it's been going on for so long. So, and you, you're butting your head against a concrete wall if you're trying to get the Supreme Court to start using the Privileges and Immunities Clause. They did it wrong in the first place, and sometimes you just have to live with that. Uh, okay. I, my question is uh, kind of ties into the same line, and I was curious, I, Professor Bender's point that um, perhaps we need some sort of principle like the right to privacy to prop this up, and I'm, I'm curious what the panel thinks, how this may interact with Professor Epstein's effort to rehabilitize um, or rehabilitate um, Lochner, whether that principle was there during that period of growth that we all have been pointing to, and the end of the Lochner era was when that principle perhaps died within constitutional law. I'll just say a few words. First, I, rather than prop this up, how about if we use grounded? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a principle of the Constitution that grounds uh, uh, the, 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 ideas, uh, the ideas here. Um, and, uh, you know, the, I, I love this phrase that, uh, that Rod used a little while ago, uh, a, pub, a policy matter that is constitutionally informed. And I think to some extent what I'm arguing for is a constitutional matter that is policy informed, uh, right? Uh, which is to say that t taking an understanding of of um, how politics works, and I'm in no way implying that Rod is naive about this, right? But, but when you read, for example, you read the Kelo case, for example, that horrendous case in the Supreme Court, right? You know, Justice Stevens' opinion reads like it's cribbed from a ninth grade civics book, right? I mean, it's a joke uh, as to how they describe the political process. And a lot of these cases have this sort of gauzy-eyed sort of unrealistic, you know, ridiculous view of the, uh, of the, the political process in a lot, of these, uh, a lot of these cases. And you wonder if the judges actually believe it or whether they feel like that's what they're supposed to say or whatever the, uh, whatever the case may be. Um, and so I think, you know, the, the, the point is that starting with a more realistic uh, uh, approach to the, the, you know, as I said, a, uh, a policy, you know, a, pol a, you know, a constitutional matter that's policy informed, right, that takes a more realistic approach to these, uh, to these things that actually, you know, digs into the, the reality that is, uh, that is behind uh, these things and have judges actually scrutinize it, I think is a useful, uh, a useful exercise. Um, and I think you put your finger on the right point, which is always in the background here for a lot of judges is Lochner, right? And, in the, and there is a legitimate concern here, which is, you know, a lot of things look like low hanging, you know, there are things that look like low hanging fruit to me, right? In my head, I think I can see cases that look like pure rent seeking with no legitimate uh, public interest. And then there's a whole bunch of other cases where there are legitimate uh, you know, arguments on both sides, right? So it's not kind of just going in and running roughshod, right? And sort of judges taking over the role as, 
libertarian sentinels of, uh, of uh, you know, good policy and good politics, right? But I think there's a role for that. I think partly what it is, and I think there's an interesting dialogue. I've been interested to hear Rod's comments, right, about how the political process responds to this, right? Will it be, as he said, um, you know, even worse, right? Where my view is, is that, 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 again, politics expands to fit the space allotted, right? And so the more the judges retrench, the more in ickier the rent seeking is, uh, is, is, is going to be. And so putting some boundaries around that will actually keep it, keep it in, its, in its place and that we can come up with principled, um, you know, and judges always, there's always gonna be fuzziness, but that we can identify hard cases uh, that are on one side of the line and a lot of cases are on the other side of the line. And just because the line is fuzzy, I'm not willing to say that judges shouldn't be, be engaged in that line drawing. The whole point about constitutional developments over the past, since the 30s, is that once the Supreme Court took more and more uh, aggressive positions about what the Constitution forbade, they prohibited legislative decision making and then prohibited su successive legislative attempts to work around many of the principles that they decided so that there is a a uh, ratchet effect, and I think that's one response to Professor Hill's concern that whatever judges do can be undone because it is a fact of life for good and for ill that once something is constitutionalized, it is no longer amenable to the democratic process. And that's, that I say that on both sides of this debate uh, because I you know, personally think that many, many of the uh, wrong, uh, many of the decisions have been very wrongly footed, but there's a ratchet effect and we're not going back on some of them at the present time. Can I just make a, a just a brief comment? Uh, I mean, I think that, I, I think that Todd is, is not cynical enough about the, the political process or the regulatory agency process. I mean, the, the idea that regulatory agencies are not captured and the idea that regulators don't then go work for the industry and they don't, are not motivated by incentives created there. I think it's naive. I think that's just not the, ev the evidence suggests that uh, regulatory agencies are just as captured as politicians are, if not more so. Um, I, I, but this is, I think, the principle. The principle is that once you allow the political process to engage in where it should not engage, to bring the full weight and force of the coercive power of government into voluntary economic transactions, once that is allowed, we can quibble about which agency should uh, restrain it the most, but none of them do. None of them do, and that's why th these powers have only increased and the involvement of uh, state and federal governments have only increased in the economy, have not decreased. There are short periods like the Jimmy Carter administration of all administrations where there was some deregulation, um, but it was, it was indeed short-lived, and in other realms, regulations increased even during that period. So, you know, again, I think, I think one has to solve these kind of problems. One has to look at some kind of principle. Uh, you, you know, and, and at, at the margin, we can make it less, you know, less imposing here or there. But unless we actually advocate a principle of economic liberty, we're not going to move the needle much over the long run. And I'll just add to that, I want to emphasize the principle of economic liberty, but the other thing that we've seen is really a decline of the rule of law, right? The principle of the rule of law of generally applicable uh, laws in a Hayekian sense, right? Generally applicable laws justified by abstract neutral principles, right? The machinery of the rent-seeking state and the machinery of the regulatory state is the arbitrary discretionary carve-outs, right? the tax loopholes, the exceptions to the regulations, the day-to-day the -day petty tyranny of the, the bureaucrats, right? Richard has written on the uh, permitting power, for example, right? And it's turned, the regulatory state has turned Americans into a nation of supplicants, right? They basically <laughs> hold, if we want to do anything, we've got to go and beg to some bureaucrat, Right, because they have so much discretion and so much arbitrary control, and the regulations, the regulatory thicket is so thick and incoherent that none of it fits together uh, properly. And so somebody somewhere there is making a, uh, a judgment. And so in addition to the principle of economic liberty, I think trying to articulate the principle of the rule of law, 
uh, so that people know what the rules are. They're generally applicable because who benefits in this, this world? It's the, it's the powerful, right? It's the people who can hire the lobbyists and the lawyers to work their way through the regulatory thicket in order to get out the other side. And it's everybody else who basically just gets overwhelmed by this, uh, this, this tidal wave. And I think that's a lot of what this is, is totally unprincipled rules just made for the benefit because some political interest group uh, uh, wants it or some exception to some rule because some political interest group wants it. And understanding that that discretion and that arbitrariness um, is its own sort of self-generating machine of more of it. And the impact on that, I think, is another principle that's worth keeping in mind. OK, we're uh, close to the end uh, here. We'll have a question over here. Hi, I'm uh, William Turner. Uh, we spent some time today talking about uh, the role of the federal judiciary as opposed to the administrative state in protecting economic liberty. Um, Professor Hill, I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more on um, what, as a practical matter, uh, a robust agency uh, enforcement of economic liberty would look like. And I know one uh, comment that you made earlier was, you know, you could go to regulations.gov and, and file uh, a comment as opposed to uh, filing a brief, which would be much more expensive. Um, as a practical matter, do you think, uh, uh, what's your experience with that? Yeah. Um I'm trying to think of contemporary deregulatory efforts. Um, and I think the most important ones actually at the federal level from agencies came from the Obama administration in education. People forget the Obama administration under um, Duncan Arney. Arne Duncan. Arnie Duncan, <laughs> um, sorry. That's a problem with having reversible first and last names. <laughs> um, launched a lot of initiatives um, to um, enlarge the scope of charter schools to limit teacher certification limits that would protect the jobs of teachers from competent competition. Um, and they did so through um, no child left behind waivers. Um, and so it was a very aggressive effort to deregulate in that area. The FTC is trying, never quite wants to deregulate occupational licensing as much as I think they have legal authority to do. But that would be a great place for a lot of you to push forward right now, is to think about working for the FTC and putting that on the FTC's agenda. You know, I think that those are two agencies that have a lot of power um, to do a lot of deregulation, and I think that's much more productive than launching um, federal um, constitutional cases. I want to emphasize once more time the state constitutional courts have been deregulatory, and I, I, I hate keeping up, bringing up Dana because it makes it look like she's got to bear the whole burden on her shoulders. But you know, you have Kelo on one side, you have Hathcock in Michigan, where the Michigan Supreme Court construes its own state constitution. Um, to de deregulate or, or to place impediments to eminent domain. And then I'll also mention that Minneapolis has abolished the single family zone. That is extraordinary. You ought to have a symposium on that. Essentially, Minneapolis reversed Euclid. Think about that. Or Scott Weiner in California with SB 50, basically getting rid of extraordinarily restrictive zoning if it passes um, in high transit areas in every city. So if you look around beyond F sup and F second, you will see a vast field of deregulatory activities that are bringing together left and right. Um, some of them do come from the federal level, but I caution you, the danger of the federal deregulation is it's often followed very quickly by federal re-regulation. And indeed, the two things go together. Once the a federal agency gets its claws into a matter, it feels like it has broad authority to do a lot of new regulatory stuff. Um, and so, you know, there's a danger there. I think federalism is actually the federal agencies, the cities, and the state supreme courts are your best bets, and they're out there, and we should use them rather than trying to flog the poor 14th Amendment horse into pulling some kind of deregulatory <laughs> wagon an inch farther. <laughs> okay, we'll take one more question. Yes, um, in, that, in that same vein, there's an important Texas case from the Texas Supreme Court called Patel, uh, authored by uh, now, ju now Judge Willett, then Justice Willett. And he goes through the analysis of the federal and Texas constitutions, but ultimately decides that ju the judiciary has a role to get involved there because liberty pre-exists the sovereign, and the only legitimate goal of the sovereign is to secure that liberty that pre-existed it. And so that is his, his role. That's where he sees the, judici the judiciary's role there. And so what I'm wondering is, uh, is, if, is if you agree with that, if you find any merit in that, and that he, 
he looks past the idea of the federal and state constitutions, but what pre-existed uh, each of their ratifications. Sounds like one for you, Ron. <laughs> I mean, I certainly agree with that. I, you know, I, I, uh, I think the most important, the most important document here is, is the declaration rather than the constitution. I think the idea of inalienable rights, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness uh, should guide every decision that, you know, that I think it, it should have framed the Constitution more explicitly and I think it should guide every decision. That is ultimately what the courts are there to protect. To protect they're there to protect the individual liberty of individuals to pursue their lives, to, to engage in action, to, to, to act based on their values, free of coercion, free of force, free of impediment. Now, that's science fiction for me to believe that more judges would take up that view, and I, w I won't be surprised if that's overturned. But that, that is the core. The core is, are we as individuals free? Are we as individuals uh, right to act, as long as there's no coercion, to act in voluntary exchange without the interference of other people and without the interference of the state? That is the fundamental question that needs to be answered. And I think the answer is yes, we should be free. And that most laws, mo almost all regulations, if not all regulations, are therefore anti-individual liberty and therefore should be wiped off the books. And with that, we close this panel and thank you very much. <laughs>